everyone and welcome back to Planeswalkers 101, the series in which we cover the complete history of Planeswalkers, one for each episode, from their birth up to the most recent news that we have of them. Before we begin, remember that the best way to support the channel and what I do is to subscribe, like and comment in the comment section down below. Today's episode is about the mysterious and lethal Rashka, the Golgari Queen. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Rashka is a female Gorgon, born around the year 4523 AR in the honor city of Ravnica. She appears as a striking green-scaled woman with long, black snake-like hair tendrils. She is thin and has bright yellow eyes which glow in the dark when unleashing their deadly, petrifying gaze. Like all Gorgons, she is greedy and always looking for new shiny trophies to add to her collection, very similar to dragons in this regard. As you might know, Ravnica, which is actually pronounced Ravnica, is a plane whose main planet is covered by a worldwide cityscape eponymously known as Ravnica. The city is an ecumenopolis, or planet-wide city, made of grand halls, decrepit slums and ancient ruins, all built through layer upon layer of stonework. Today, it is so vast that its name has long become synonym with the entire plane. 10,000 years prior to the event of Ravnica, the plane was in a situation of extreme violence overrun by constant war and skirmishes between the various factions that inhabited it. Realizing that the never-ending conflict would ultimately destroy everything, a council comprising of the 10 most powerful faction leaders was held. During the meeting, Azor I, who was one of the leaders, proposed to establish a living and breathing enchantment that would end the suffering and ensure the survival of everyone. It took some convincing, but the other nine faction leaders eventually agreed to Azur's idea and each of the ten factions signed what became known as the Guild Pact. Then, with time, the ten factions became known as the Ten Guilds of Ravnica. Now, the Guild Pact was not your typical paper contract, but rather an ancient and epic piece of magic that still reverberates across the entire plane and that, if broken, would bring automatic magical consequences on those who defied it. Its power was subtle. It prevented any guild from interfering with the businesses of others while maintaining the possibility for each group to call for collective action if any of the factions had gone rogue or endangered this delicate balance. Of course, as a result of the pact, not every guild would come out having the same importance, both socially and politically. As the city of Ravnica was built higher and higher, the lower regions fell to the darker guilds and became known as the Undercity, and this is the place where Rashka spent her youth. At first, she had a fairly simple life in the Undercity. She lived on the outer edge of the Golgari Swarm, the black ring guild of Ravnica that embodied the transcendence between life and death. However, as she would soon find out, on the plane of Ravnica, even the most futile political matter can completely subvert the lives of many. Rashka was only 17 when the Azorius Senate, the White Blue Guild originally founded by Azor I, decided that the Golgari forces had grown too powerful and too numerous due to their use of reanimation magic. The swarm needed to be stopped and pushed out of certain areas that the Azorius had conveniently claimed for themselves. Because the Senate functioned as a government de facto on Ravnica, Isperia, a high-ranking Azorius judge, immediately issued a writ of mass arrest for anyone found bearing any kind of allegiance to the Golgari. Unfortunately for her, Rashka was among those apprehended and, together with thousands of people, she was taken to an Azorius detention compound. Predictably, the situation of mass hysteria and paranoia meant that cells rapidly reached their maximum capacity and the tensions originated by abuses quickly turned into riots. These events came to be known as the Dusk and the Troubles. In an attempt to tame the prison riots and restore the order, Rashka and other inmates were ferried away to a secure and isolated location in the basement of the detention building. Hours passed, and the unrest grew thicker as the guards gave in to fear and consequently more abuses. Soon enough, the prisoners decided that they had taken enough from their captors. The majority of the prisoners were Golgari men and women, and many of them put their trust in Rashka, who was the youngest and strongest among them. So they started working together to free her. 
Before they could set the woman free, however, the Azorius guards noticed what was going on inside Rashka's cell and decided to take her out to teach a lesson to the other prisoners. Four Azorius jailers viciously beat Rashka with wooden clubs and sticks, punching and kicking her all over her body. With warm, sticky blood in her mouth, the defenseless Gorgon used all the strength she had left to roll over on her back and look into the eyes of her attackers. The vile man responded with laughter and prepared to land the final blow to end this macabre show. But just a moment before their clubs crashed Rashka's skull, her spark ignited and she planes walked away, disappearing in a cloud of black shadows. She woke up in a swamp on a dark plain with almost all of her ribs shattered and no idea where she was. Scared, disoriented and sore, she laid in the darkness, unable to understand what had happened and much time passed before she was able to control her abilities. Two years after her disappearance, Rashka returns to Ravnica. In her travels across the multiverse, she has learned an important lesson by which she has decided to live her life. A person should always die the death that they deserve. As soon as the Gorgon Place Walker is back in town, she immediately starts gathering followers to organize her revenge. Her plans are to seek retribution not only for herself, but also for anyone who had suffered at the ends of the Azorius and anyone who had helped them. Many will die both by her hands and in her name, and ironically, all deaths would be thematically related to the way these people had lived their lives. Amongst Rushka's many victims, there was always a special place reserved for the Azorius, whose initial thirst for political supremacy had overturned Rushka's life completely. Soon enough, the Green Black Planeswalkers started to track down and slaughter those who had actively taken part in the riots. The four guards that had contributed to her ascension were the first. As time goes by and her quests of bloody vengeance start piling up, she becomes something of a mysterious and elusive urban legend amongst the Golgari Swarm Guild, and so become also the assassins of the Okran, the cult of mercenaries operating in and out of the Undercity that followed her. The Okran, most of which were Devkarin or Dark Elves, were a group of cold-blooded assassins particularly known for their virulence and deadliness of their poison. Rashka would be very careful not to get caught. She would only resurface from her hiding when something stirred up her interest and the exact reasoning or pattern for this was obscure to anyone involved. She'd pick her missions carefully and would be smart enough to always remain as far as possible from guild politics. With time, however, the effectiveness of her killing granted her fame even outside the younger city, but no one, no matter how hard they tried, could ever catch her. After a mission, she would swiftly disappear back into the other, fading into shadows taking her expertise to other plane to further improve her skills and give in to some trophy hunt to continue to grow her enormous collection. At some point, Rashka tries to force the mind mage Jace Bellerin into her service, but to no avail. On the contrary, as the two confront each other, the Varinian planeswalker manages to shine a light into her existence, possibly undoing everything she tried to accomplish by detaching herself from every form of compassion and kindness. Neutralized by Jace, Rashka's attention turns to other matters. She establishes contact with the Golgari outcasts dwelling in the other city and manages to rally them against the Devkarin lich Jarad, who was guild leader of the Golgari at the time, and his army of elves. Amongst the many who follow her, she finds reliable allies in the six-legged insectile creatures known as Kral. These parasites delved, among other things, into darker necromancies, and their magical skills were useful to Rashka to unearth the erstwhile an ancient breed of elves who had been buried alive in catacombs located in Umurilak, below the Undercity. One day, an agent of Nicol Bolas, the scheming old dragon who aimed at conquering the entirety of the multiverse, places a note in the Owls of Okran to invite Rashka to the Meditation Plane. There, Bolas promises Rashka the position of Golgari Guildmaster, as well as the lives of those who had preyed on the oppressed on Ravnica for all those years. All he asks in return is for her to travel to the Uncharted Plain of Ixalan and deliver the precious artifact stored in the Golden City of Araska to Tezzeret, who was another one of his agents. To help the Gorgon in his quest, Bolas gifts her with a thematic compass as well as the art of sailing. Upon accepting this deal, the newly born Captain Rashka adds toward Ixalan and poses as a member of the Brazen Coalition, 
a society of independent pirates living in the storm-wrecked sea of Ixalan, claiming to be at the service of the mysterious Lord Nicholas. Then she assembles her crew and sails aboard her ship, the Belligerent, proving to be a very democratic leader which translates into a great deal of respect and admiration from her crew. Guided by the compass, she also stumbles upon a shipwrecked Jace on an island in the sea. Realizing that the Blue Planeswalkers has no idea about who he is and has completely lost his memories, she decides to take him on board, sparing his life. Soon enough, a new relationship will start to grow between the two, this time based on respect and attraction. One day at sea, as the two are looking for Araska, the Golden City reveals itself, emerging from the marine depths and causing both planeswalkers to fall into the rough waters. To Rashka's horror, the shock causes Jace's memories to return. The Gorgon is terrified at the idea that this would reignite their enmities, but surprisingly, things go differently. In the face of adversities, their bond grows stronger than ever as the two struggle onto Araska, where they are unexpectedly met by a living legend of their own plane, apparently guarding the artifact that they are looking for, Azor the Lowbringer. The two planeswalkers don't even have the time to realize what's about to happen when they are jumped by the Sphinx. The battle is fierce, and both sides take severe hits, but in the end, Jace unleashes his powers as the living Gilpact, and Rashka witnesses him banishing the Supreme Azorius Judge to a long and forgotten island. Realizing that the tender feelings she holds for Jace would constitute a weak spot for Bolas to take advantage of, Rashka asks Jace to remove every memory she has of him from her mind. Jace agrees, and he also plants a fake memory in Raska's head depicting her using the artifact stored in Aratska to annihilate Azor. However, planning to defeat Bolas together, the Mind Mage installs a trigger that can be used to restore the Gorgon's memory when the time is right. After this, Raska summons Deseret and hands to him the Immortal Sun, which was the precious artifact from the Golden City that Bolas wanted so badly. The Metal Mage then takes it and brings it off the plane using the planner bridge that he had opened on the plane of Kaladesh. Rashka too then planeswalks away. Okay, so what is this immortal sun and why does Bolas want it so badly? To understand this, we need to take a few steps back. Ages ago, the ancient Finx planeswalker Azor created together with a spirit dragon a massive stone slab imbued with the power of his own spark. Its function was to act as both a bait and a cage for planeswalkers, who would be drawn on the plane by the relic's immense power and wouldn't then be able to leave it afterwards due to the planar barrier that it exercised on the plane. Moreover, the trap was designed specifically for the vicious Nicol Bolas. Sure that his thirst for power would have pushed him to look for the artifact, Azur and Ugin hoped to trap the Elder Dragon on Ixalan, liberating the multiverse once and for all of this threat. Indeed, the Immortal Sun is immensely powerful, so powerful that it could gift its bearer command over nature, eternal life and godlike powers. Definitely not something you want in Bolas' hands. Apart from the obvious reasons then, Bolas wanted the Immortal Sun to use it in the upcoming War of the Sparks, which we'll see later. No spoilers for now, although if you see my Liliana's video you know what I'm talking about and if you did, go check it out right now. Ultimately, by transferring the artifact through the Planar Bridge, the barrier is lifted and Rashka is able to planeswalk back to Bolas. Waiting for her in the meditation plane, Bolas reads Rashka's mind and gets tricked into seeing the fake memories that Jace has planted for him. Pleased by what he sees, the dragon calls the Gorgon guild leader Rashka and rewards her with the exact location of Jarad, who had been on the run for quite some time. Then, as Rashka sets out to petrify Jarad, it is said that she can help but feeling that both she and Bolas had missed something very important during the meeting, although she couldn't really say what. The Golgari planeswalker will land back on Ravnica and head directly for Jarad. After having easily disposed of his personal guard, the Gorgon uses her deadly stare to kill him and establishes herself as true guildmaster of the Golgari. In the coop, she is helped by the Ursua and the Insectal Kral, both of which will gain a higher societal status under Rashka's leadership. So much so as to become loyal to her personally rather than to the Swarm. Not everyone is happy about Rashka's rise though. The Dark Elves react with bitterness to the death of Jarad, who, after all, was one of their kind. Indeed, the Death Korean wanted the Matka, or High Princess, Azoni Thousand Eyed, to take over the deceased leader and claim her rightful spot as Guildmaster to the Swarm. 
This, however, never happened. After some time, a telepath crawl named Zedek, who happened to be a close ally to Queen Rashka, senses Jace's planted memory in his Queen Zed, and at her request, it removes it. All of a sudden, the Golgari Queen could remember all about Ixalan and her friendship with Jace, as well as her newfound righteousness. With almost all the pieces of the puzzle laid in front of her, she realizes that Bolas's plan is to invade Ravnica with his army of Eternals really soon. Little did she know that the occupation of Ravnica was but the first step of Bolas's true aims. Anyway, that same night, as new guildmaster of the Golgari Swarm, Rashka is summoned to the guild summit of New Prov to discuss important matters. Ral Zarek of the Izzet League had called a meeting to organize the Ravnican resistance against Nico Bolas, whose real plans had been discovered by Niv Mizzet, the Firemind. According to the dragon, Bolas was planning to complete the Elder Spell, a potent manifestation of Elder Magic, to kill and harvest Planeswalker's sparks to achieve ultimate power and godhood. To avoid this disaster, the Thunder Dragon of the Izzet Leg wants to implement the failsafe contained in the Guild Pact to grant him the powers of the living Guild Pact. So basically, he wants to channel all the magical power of the Guild Pact onto a single living being, in this case, himself. For this to happen, however, each of the ten guilds of Ravnica had to agree to the motion, and although many distrusted the Fireman's motives, with some convincing all could have ended up agreeing to it in the light of the greater threat. All but one. The Ors of Syndicate, led by its Council of Ghosts, known as the Obzidat, would have never seen reason. Unwilling to even risk a no for an answer, Raul plans ahead, and before the summit even begins, he stages an attack by the Golgari Swarm on Urzova, which is the guild hall of the Syndicate. Eager to prove herself as a worthy guild leader, Rashka accepts to pledge her guild to attack the Orzovs in order to change its leadership. Together with Ral and the Ractus emissary Ekara, the Golgari Guildmaster leads an army of zombies, trolls, and giant insects into Orzova's headquarters as a distraction. This allows the planeswalker Kaya to kill the Obsidat, and all this was meant for the Ors of Lomed Tesa Karlov to regain her power within the guild and succeed the Obsidat as the new Ors of Guild leader. However, things don't go as expected and Kaya involuntarily becomes the new guildmaster by means of the ancient Ors of Magical Succession rules. When the summit finally takes place in New Prov, both Kaya and Tesa attend as Ors of Syndicate representatives. The tension between the guilds is high, and it grows even thicker when Mizzet proceeds to illustrate his plan. Predictably, his speech is met with doubts and skepticism. So, in order for each guild to properly evaluate Niv's request, the Azorius Guildmaster and High Judge Chair of the Summit, Esperia, adjourns the meeting until the following morning. That same night, however, Rashka meets with Esperia alone in the conference chamber. It was the same Esperia that had issued that Master Rest writ so many years before. Harrowed by her thirst for revenge, Rashka ultimately gives in to her vengeful desires and ruthlessly petrifies Esperia. The following day, the guild leaders reconvene, but only to be met with the horrible finding of Esperia's lifeless body having been turned into stone. Every hope for cooperation now seems shattered. Okay, so I got a little problem here, because, I mean, it's ten people, and one of you has the power to petrify other people. You find someone dead overnight. Petrified. The two have history. I mean, can't you just... Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, let's not jump straight ahead to conclusions and actually try to zoom out here for a second to try and see things from a different perspective. Although a very strong one, in fact, revenge is not the sole motive that Rashka had to kill Hesperia and blow any possible form of guild cooperation at the summit. The Golgari Queen had been sincerely honest in approaching Rala and Kaya to offer her service to their cause. However, all changes when she meets a Devkarin elf who turns out to be a vessel possessed by Bolas. The Elder Dragon points out that, by getting entangled in the meaningless politics of Ravnica, Rashka has defied his authority and challenged him. Okay, um, so as punishment, he threatens to turn the erstwhile against the Golgari through mind control, causing countless death and chaos for her people, as she not swore complete and unquestioned allegiance to him. Not really a punishment that would fit the crime if you ask me, but still. Rejoice, said Bolas. For thy next task shall bring most wondrous joy upon thee. <laughs> 
As it turns out, killing Isperia and subsequently blowing up the summit was in fact the task that Bolas had entrusted to Rashka, who simultaneously fulfilled both Bolas' demands and achieved personal revenge for the sufferings of her youth. After that, the Black Rim Planeswalker continues to faithfully serve Bolas to avoid losing her position as Golgari Guildmaster. Now here, we could debate about the decisions, but anyway. In the meantime, Rashka's betrayal is not taken lightly by the Elder Guild leaders, and during a direct confrontation with Raul and Aurelia, the Guild leader of the Boris Legion, the Gorgon only manages to escape at the cost of Zedek's life. Also, as a backup plan after the summit has failed, Raul proposes to build a great machine across the 10th district of Ravnica that would, in theory, enable the ascension of Niv-Mizzet as Living Guild Pact even without the consent of all the 10 guilds. In order for this plan to work, however, Raul acknowledges that the nodes of energy in Sangru and Golgari territories had to be taken by force. Aurelia of the Boris Legion and the Vidal Complainswalker Dovin Ban, who had succeeded Hesperia as a Zorius Guild Master, agreed to do just that. Both locations are then conquered at the cost of many lives. But the surprises are not over. Soon enough, Ban drops the charade and reveals to be another one of Bolas' pawns, sabotaging Raul's machine at the perfect moment for it to fail and avoid Nave's ascension. At this moment, a furious Bolas orders Rashka to track down and slaughter Raul to avert any other surprises. As Bolas and his forces begin their arrival on the plane, then the same Raul is sent by the Farmine to activate the Interplanar Beacon, a magical tower capable of transmitting messages to planeswalkers across the multiverse. The goal here is to desperately ask for assistance to anyone who dare to call across the multiverse to fight off the invasion. Then, Bolas and the Firemind confront each other on the battlefield. Although the battle is brief, the Izzet Dragon mounts an impressive assault that demonstrates its immense thaumaturgical, mental and physical might. Nicol Bolas and Niv-Mizzet engage each other in an epic battle that destroys entire parts of the city. The two dragons fight off using a staggering array of magical, physical and aerial attacks in which both grow blood. At one point, Bolas is even surprised that his mind-shattering touch cannot penetrate the Firemind's mental barriers. As the fight wears on, however, Niv senses his eventual defeat. After he collapses a huge chunk of the city onto Bolas at a Simic Zonut, Bolas emerges in a dark sphere of death and destruction, causing Niv to experience fear for the first time in his life. Contemplating this strange feeling, Nev deems it unworthy of the fire mind and swiftly pushes it aside as he rows in defiance and leaps again towards his impending death. It is said that in the end, Nev Mizzet's skull and charred bones were all that remained. Going back to Raul, held by Kaya and Akara, he is able to bypass the Azorius guards and enter the Beacon Tower, only to find Rashka and a bolus possessed Lavinia waiting for him. At the cost of Akara's life, Raul is able to successfully defeat Rashka and to free Lavinia. Then, he activates the Interplanar Beacon to urge other planeswalkers to immediately travel to Ravnica for help. The red-blue planeswalker could have never imagined that that was exactly what Bolas was counting on. In the meantime, Rashka, who has proven to be no match for the fully empowered Izzet Killmaster, has been forced to planeswalk away to avoid getting brutally killed in the fight. She will land back on the plane of Ixalan, and as a result of that, she will not be present of Ravnica when Bolas' invasion will fully unfold. On Ixalan, she is presented with the possibility to actually flee and avoid the conflict to rebuild something for herself. However, worried that the Golgari swarm would fall apart without her, she eventually decides to go back to Ravnica out of obligation and concern towards her people. Upon returning to her home plane, she finds Raal and Kaya in the Undercity, trying to unsuccessfully convince the other Gulgari leaders to support their cause. Despite Raal and Kaya's rightful suspicion of the Gorgon, Rashka reunites once more the Gulgari and pledges the entire guild to the fight against Bolas. Then, with the help of Ajani and other members of the Gatewatch, they are able to evacuate many civilians through the tunnels below the city, where they'd be safe from the Dread Horde. After that, Rashka heads to Rix Mahdi, the guild hall of Eractus alongside Raal, Teo and Araithia Shatka to negotiate with Raktus himself. The demon is initially hostile towards the group due to the death of his emissary, Araka, and Exava, the leader of the Blood Witches, orders them to leave. 
However, when every hope of establishing a dialogue seems to be lost, an Ors of representative named Tomek shows up carrying Ikara's corpse. The Rakdos woman is resurrected as a blood witch, and after having defeated Exava in a single combat, she uses her newfound authority as leader of the blood witches to lead the Rakdos guild against Bolas. Unexpectedly, Rakdos himself would join the fray too. With all the ten guilds reunited against Bolas and his dread horde of Eternals led by the necromancer Liliana Vess, Nissa Ravain performs a ritual at the ruins of the guild back chamber. With the help of a representative from each guild, the Elven Planeswalker is able to heal the ley lines that originally empowered the Living Guild Pact. The conduits of mana had previously been disrupted when Bolas had destroyed the Guildback Chamber by opening his portal to Ravnica there. Then, using a device that Mizzet had constructed before his death to preserve his consciousness, Nissa is able to resurrect the Mighty Dragon and grant him the power of the Living Guild Pact. Niv comes back to life just in time to save the others from the god eternal Kefnet who would have assaulted the ruins of the chamber soon after. By using his newfound and amplified power, Niv completely incinerates Kefnet in a torrent of flames, although the strain of channeling enough energy to kill a god causes the dragon to fall unconscious. Later, as the War of the Sparks draws to a close, Braskar reunites with Jace on the battlefield. The situation is grim. The Gatewatch and Ravnican forces are losing, and Jace, not wanting to depart from Rashka without truly looking her into the eyes one last time, tries to restore her memories, only to find out that they've been already restored by Zedek. Okay, so this, to be honest, is quite a dramatic anticlimax for Jace, don't you think? Because, you know, you got this huge end of the world battle, and he just wants to say goodbye and do the hero thing where he restores the memories, and he can't? That's a little anticlimactic for me, but I guess that's okay. Okay, so in a moment of despair, Rashka confesses to the Blue Mage that although she had always been fully aware of the threat that Bolas posed to the entire multiverse, she had nonetheless murdered Hesperia in a burst of bloodthirsty rage and longing for vengeance, while knowing that that would have further helped Bolas's plans. Completely blinded by love, however, Jace tells her that she has his forgiveness and promises that they will finally be together if they make it out of the war alive. In the end, Niv's contribution alongside Liliana's defection and Gideon's sacrifice lead to the defeat of Nico Bolas and to the victory of the Gatewatch and Ravnica forces. Rashka survives the war and she is also present during the plain wise celebration that follows. There, she finds her beloved Jace and the two finally share a kiss. Later, however, the Golgari Queen is confronted by Niv Mizzet and the other Guildmasters, who collectively decide to spare her life, seeing how she had changed sides before the actual battle began. Pardon does not come free of charge though, and the guilds have one condition. Rashka has to make amends by hunting down one of the planeswalkers who had remained loyal to Bolas or had defected too late. As penance for her crimes, Rashka is assigned the task of capturing the planeswalker Dovin Ban. By command of the new Living Guild Pact, who feared any possible interference by his predecessor, Jace Bellmer had to be kept out of the loop concerning the assignments. Also, Rashka's lies about her tasks and the ultimate choice to remain with the Golgari result in them growing apart again. As if this wasn't enough, although Rashka is still technically Guildmaster of the Golgari Swarm, during her absence her position has been heavily contested. The Elf Shaman Saraya, the Devkarin Izoni, the Troll Varos, the Kroll Azdamas, and the erstwhile leader Storov all claim to have a right to the title. Dovin, in the meantime, has been blinded by the Demir Guildmaster of Azov and has hidden in his safe house on Ravnica. There, he is struck down by Rashka, and to convince the Gorgon to spare his life, he offers his help to retain control over the swarm. Rashka accepts this offer, and together they frame Izoni for a crime that she hasn't committed, effectively removing the strongest amongst the competition. Then, the two plot to fake Dovin's death through a replica statue of the mage. A fight is staged on Zunara, on the plain of Ragatha, with Chandra Nalar being an unsuspecting accomplice. During the fake fight, Rashka severs Dovin's right hand to use it as proof of kill, while Chandra genuinely thinks that she has landed the final blow. The plan succeeds and Ban returns to Ravnica, but he is later killed by the Demir assassin Actos Star, who had been sent by Lazav as part of a plan to later have leverage on Rashka. And so, the snake-haired planeswalker is now in firm control over the Golgari swarm again, 
but in return, she's blackmailed and controlled by Lazav of the House of Mir, who threatens to make her failure to kill Ban known to the Living Guild Pact if Rashka doesn't comply with his wishes. But how long can this last? For how long will the deadly, ruthless Gorgon submit to the dirty blackmailing of a coward? Vigilant, tense, and ready, the merciless planeswalker lurks in the shadows of the night, seeking the perfect opportunity to widen her stare and grab her revenge once more. Hey you guys, thank you so much for stopping by and taking the time to watch this episode of my Planeswalker 101 series. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please remember that the best way to support me is by smashing that subscribe and like buttons. What about you? What do you think about Rashka's fate, and how do you think our story will evolve in the future? Make sure you let me know in the comment section down below, alongside any other planeswalker that you would like to see featured in one of my future videos. Also, remember to follow me on Twitter and to join the Discord server so you never miss any of the upcoming videos. Once again, thank you so much for watching. My name is Octopus, and I will see you in the next one.